Hi everybody, I'm Christian. Welcome to Lazy Devs. Welcome to a tutorial about how to make a roguelike in Pico 8. This is episode 9 and so far um, I've been like reviewing some of the feedback that I received from the previous episodes and the feedback has been oh, really good. There's some really good comments in the previous videos that I wanted to like maybe address a little bit. Um, so today what we're gonna do we're gonna go through some of the uh, feedback we're gonna also draw go through some of my my very own notes that I wrote down as I was editing this video where it's like come on Christian <laughs> you're embarrassing yourself in front of other people um, and then later on we're gonna start a new um, new system that, that is I think very important for our game and that system is going to be about creating monsters very, it's going to be like a multi-part situation here because those monsters um, that they will require a lot of changes. Um, so anyway, we had like this comment from um, from Matt Hayes, Matt Hayes, Matt Hayes, and he said that uh, he suggested. Uh, thank you for the comments, by the way. He suggested that um, um, the way we do the bump is we can achieve that easier. We can achieve that simpler. Simply if we um, we kind of like use the same um, thing that we already noticed, how we can actually use our walk animation to create like, a uh, effect that's very similar to the bump. Where, um, um, you know, it's kind of like uh, we have our, our, our sprite spawn, in, in the wall and return basically and that's kind of like it looks almost like as if as, as if the as if it was the bump animation and i do agree but you know i kind of like i like this attention to detail that we kind of like we have like two different animations and um we we might you know if this is going to be like a system that will be maybe expanded upon and maybe there's gonna be more elaborate animations maybe different things that you can do then I still want to maybe have like the system in place where you can like really control what is happening with a character. Maybe it's going to be like a jump or something. I don't know. However, I think this comment is good, and I will propose maybe doing like a little, I don't know, like a heart for example here, or let me let me pick maybe some different emoji, <laughs> some kind of like symbol to um, to denote that okay, um, we could maybe save some tokens here. In the future, if you're really looking for some kind of um, looking for a way to save tokens, here would be a place to do so. If you really need tokens for some really really cool killer feature, let's do it like a star. Let's do the star here that we had. There's the star. So um, we're gonna just dot down this comment like, okay, here's a place where we might be able to save tokens later on at the end you know right now we're at 800 tokens it's it's kind of like silly that we are doing this here's a little thing where i had like um quotations uh, not quotations brackets uh, parentheses that were superfluous so <laughs> i didn't notice this when i was watching the videos like no <laughs> um so we can remove them here there was also a comment from tobias lankov he is commenting very very often thank you so much tobias uh, and he uh, suggested some really cool little tricks. Uh, one of the tricks he was really um, apprehensive, or not apprehensive, he was like mm, questioning a little bit if um, the way we um, solve button presses, if that was uh, it, if that was even, uh, if there was maybe a potential of making it even more efficient. And I agree, um, uh, I, or at least I think it's a good, good, good way, good thinking there. I think to be like, okay, there's an F, um for um, for I loop, um, for next loop here, and you know maybe there's even even a more efficient way here. So he suggested maybe doing like a um, when you call button press without a number, like with just an empty thing here, it returns like a um, bit field, and that bit field is, can be translated to a number, and you could like use that an array to kind of like quickly, without actually looping through all of the buttons, quickly just assess which buttons are pressed and get the results from an array. Uh, I think that would be possible. Um, but um, I decided, I, I think it's, it's kind of good to keep it like as it is, it kind of like take all the penalties that are associated with, with this here. Um, um, because um, we're gonna, as we saw already with the with the outline function for the text, we are actually reusing this, this array for a lot of other things. So I don't want to be uh, messing around with this array too much. And also later on, we're gonna use a um, technique to kind of like compress those arrays to make them save, make them save like really a lot of tokens because those arrays cost a lot of tokens, right? If I remove them, it's like that's gonna be like did what this one array was like um, you know fourteen tokens right there. <clears throat> and I can like melt them down to just like a um, few tokens. Um, so, 
So I want to keep all most of our data, most of the stuff that's like big arrays. I want to keep it like in very simple, you know, comma separated value type of arrays. And I want to be don't want to be messing around with like zero um, with arrays that start at zero or have like gaps in between. <coughs> Okay, so what did I wrote? I also wrote down some stuff. Um, when we do do but, there is a superfluous um, there is a superfluous return here. We uh, that was kind of something that we inherited from here, where we're looping through a lot of buttons, um, and but we're no longer looping through a lot of buttons, so we can remove this return, cost us a little bit, uh, save us a little bit. Um, then, um, oh yeah, this little thing here, talk wind. Um, is not equals nil. You can remove that. So I already mentioned this previously. Um, nil is equivalent to false, and an object is equivalent to true. <laughs> um, so if there is something inside talkwind, if there is an object associated with talkwind, then you can just plug it into an if statement, and that if statement basically checks does talkwind exist. Then do stuff, and if it doesn't exist, if it's equal to nil, then don't do it. So you can save the equals nil um, to you know shave up some tokens, make it a bit more readable. And now we have to, I think, address the elephant, uh, address the elephant in the room. This is not good. I, mm, I, mean, I really like this rect fill two function, but I think in this specific uh, program there might be not enough um, reasons to. Um, to justify it, I'm sad to say it. Uh, so I will, uh, I will actually go ahead and I will actually remove those two rectfuls because the way we're doing the outlines is actually too elaborate. Just write, just just look at how many tokens we can save here. 867 we have right now, so we can remove those two rectfuls here, and then we can just go rect wx plus one. Wy plus one, Wx plus W with minus two, Wy plus W height minus two, and then color is going to be six. And how many do we have now? Fifty-six. So we kind of saved ten tokens right there. And we can, you might even save more tokens. See, it looks the same. Because the, the way we drew this kind of window before is we kind of like uh, drew concentric uh, like rectangles that overlapped each other and we can that's how we created like we drew like a gray rectangle and inside we drew a black rectangle. But the way I do it now is just I draw one black rectangle and inside I just just draw a frame. That's uh, one uh, rectangle less to draw. And that also means that in the tools this rect fill to function uh, at the end of the uh, at the end of the day, later on, we might actually be like, ah, we could remove this to save some tokens. How much is this function worth? Wow, that's another 20 tokens just there. <laughs> yeah, that's probably not going to be worth it. Okay, so far so good. Uh, one more thing, I already noticed, uh, mentioned that I wanted to copy some of the sounds from my from my original thing, from my original prototype. Um, I kind of like adapted the sounds and kind of like showed you the, how the sounds look in Pico 8, but I actually want to have now the actual exact sounds that I already created. Not just because I'm a, I'm obsessed about those things. So let me let me click real quick here. Uh, let, me, let me move this apart so I can show you for those of you who missed this and when we did it in the breakout tutorial. So this is, um, I just, oops, re reload it please. So um, this is just basically a Pico 8 file when you open it in a text editor. I'm using text, uh, I'm using a Notepad++ which is a really good free uh, text editing tool. And you see, um, if you scroll all the way down, you see there's like lines of numbers in the SFX section here. Do you have like the map? Your um, I don't know your your graphics or your tile sets are here stored as numbers, and also your sound effects. And you see that these are like the last sound effects here, all these lines here. So I have one, two, three, four, five. The five last sound effects I'm gonna just copy over from from this file. One, two, three, four, five. Copy, and I'm gonna paste them exactly the same spot here. One, oops, one, two, three, four, five. Bam. And if you want to have my sound effects, then again, you can always download the file at the end of each episode in the doobly-doo. And if you download the file, you can do the same process with your game as well. You can just copy over my sounds, then you will get my sounds. 
Coolio. Okay, I'm gonna um, load pork here because I just want I just want to make sure that it actually works and the sounds are working and they're not like garbled up or something. Sometimes it, uh, you make some kind of mistake. No, it sounds fine. Okay, good. Okay, um, so the next step, the next big step that is coming up is gonna be about um, drawing, making enemies. So far we can like interact with things. Um, what was that? Uh, you can just like bump twice. Um, so far you can like inter interact with some, some environment and that's good, but that's not really good gameplay. Um, usually, it's a bit of a trope, but usually part of RPGs and part of um, roguelikes for certain um, is, you know, some kind of combat. You, you have some kind of monsters, they attack you and you kind of like fight um, against them. Um, I would, at this point, I would also suggest that, you know, this is kind of like part of game design as well. Like I would actually um, urge, you to, urge you to uh, question this dogma. I don't think like combat is all that necessary in games. I think we should be trying to like move away from that a little bit, try to explore different venues because it's getting a bit stale, always like, you know, smashing monsters. I think there's more interesting things you can do in games or you can like take the same mechanics but kind of skin them differently and that maybe allows you to kind of like try different things that are um, that are not going the same, the same, uh, down the same path. However, as I said at the beginning of the tutorial is we are going to make a, like a very vanilla kind of experience. So let's have some monsters. Um, you, even if you're in traditional combat, you might still want to have like some kind of interactions with some kind of other characters that are maybe moving freely and stuff like that. I also, by the way, I noticed I'm saying stuff like that quite a lot in recent days. I have to apologize about this by, by, by uh, noticing myself, maybe I will, I will be more cognizant of it. Okay, so we want to draw monsters. We want to draw other characters. And this is also something that I think Tobias commented on is, um, mm, the way we have our character, our main character set up right now is like very, like these are individual uh, variables, right? So it would make maybe make sense to turn him into an object. Uh, and I would say like, this is something I would generally question. I would generally question turning things into objects unless you really have a reason to. And here's the thing, like most people coming from other programming languages are used to the, like this dogma of object, object oriented programming being like this big thing. Like everybody in like uh, computer science courses teach you object oriented programming as the second coming of Jesus. And like, this is the best thing. This is the way things work. This is how good programming gets done and stuff like that. And stuff like that. <laughs> and I would, I would question that dogma. I don't think object programming is always the right solution. Um, I think it's a good tool in your bag as a, as a programmer, but you shouldn't be using it always. You should be cognizant of why you're actually using it and what you're actually gaining from it. And a lot of the like top level promises of why object programming is, pro object programming is good are actually, uh, they're over promising of what actually object oriented programming uh, delivers. Like for example, reusability is something that for us, especially in like Pico 8 stuff, rarely plays a, um, makes a makes a difference usually our, our programs are pretty small and all of our functions are very bespoke so we cannot actually like you know pick up systems from games and, and move them in other systems we can pick out maybe individual um, functions that's why you have like these tools things but as we saw with the rectful function even those you will start actually um, second guessing them and, and, and thinking about if they're actually necessary and especially the fact that in pico 8 every time you draw a dot like you know you would have something like player.x, right? Player.x, that costs uh, or equals three or something, right? That costs four tokens because it's player dot equals in three, I think. I'm not sure if it's four tokens. Let me see. Is it four tokens? Yeah, it's four tokens. But um, player underscore x equals three, that's just uh, three tokens. So, you, so just just by using this dot, just by having this one dot here, we are w investing a token in, into it. And every time we're gonna start addressing like the position of the player, we change the position of the player, we manipulate the position of the player, we will be spending this one token. Um, so we wanna make sure that if we are investing those tokens into this thing, that we're actually getting something from it. And uh, quite often I see people uh, like, they have like a game where they just have one thing that you control like a ship, but they immediately gun for like, okay, we're gonna have to create ship, ship.x, 
um, and then ship.hp. And there is like no other object in the game that has like these kind of properties. Uh, and so it's like this very lonesome object that is kind of like um, suggesting like a, like uh, that there's some structure that there that this might be part of a bigger group of objects, but actually it's all alone and you're not actually getting anything from the fact that there's a dot here. In other programming language, there might be a reason for still going for something like this because you create a namespace and you can like put in methods inside this object so you can like structure your, your code a little bit. But in Pico 8, you don't really have these options. You don't. Really, you can't really put methods into objects. You can, but it's kind of like weird because you have like always like this this dot solution. So you actually don't really have any methods. Um, so yeah, um, <laughs> very long talk, very long speech, and maybe some of you don't really understand what I'm talking about. But um, basically, the takeaway is question objects in general, but also especially in Pico 8, because there is like a steep price associated with them. In our case, however, um, Tobias was actually spot on. <laughs> he was right, actually, we're gonna use objects. <laughs> um, so I actually, I coded this without objects. I coded it, um, or not, I did code it with objects, but the way I coded previously, I had an array of objects that were monsters, and then I had my player who was set up like this. And that was good, it worked, and you know, I, I came underneath the token limit. But I noticed that later on, um, when I started like creating a lot of um, methods to, for um, monsters to interact with the player, I noticed that I always have to write every second twi uh, every method twice. Once for, you know, uh, for the monsters, and the second time for the player. Um, because the player was, the values of the properties of the player were addressed differently than the properties of a monster. Um, so this time around, when I'm recoding it now, I'm actually gonna like explore some uncharted territory by actually going off script and actually turning our player into a kind of monster. So um, players and monsters are gonna be belong to the same type of object, and when they interact, when they hit each other, when um, when they move, when they're being animated, um, all of these functions will apply to the player and the monsters as well. So you just will just have like monsters hitting each other basically. Uh, the player will be still like a special type of monster that it will have like its own variable that we can um, uh, address quickly. But um, um, but yeah, he will belong kind to the same type of object. Um, there is a bit of I'm, I'm so, some things I'm not, still not quite sure about. For example, we will have an array of monsters, and it's not really clear if we're gonna add our player to that array or not. Mm, that's going to be a bit of a question that I'm going to figure out as we go. Maybe there's going to be some kind of or, um, natural or um, organic solution that comes out of it. Maybe we're going to have like two arrays, one array with all of the monsters and players and one array that is just the bad monsters. <sighs> I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Let's think. Let's, uh, let's figure this out as we go. Long speech. Uh, there's some good news. So uh, for the prototype of, um, of uh, Porklike, I used monsters from a pixel artist I found on the internet from Japan. His name is, or his nickname is, Ki or her nickname, I'm not sure, is Kirai S, Kirai underscore S. And he or her, um, they, um, I really liked though, like they, they posted it like in 2016, like a huge array of like really nice two bit kind of monsters. I will show you them real quick. It looks like this. Um, let me zoom in a little bit. So I, I really love this and I kind of like when I saw this, I, I thought to myself, okay, I'm gonna actually one time I'm gonna make a game uh, using some of those monsters because there's some really beautiful monsters. There's like four frame animations for those monsters. And they're, they're so creative and, and using like the, the, um, the two color pixel palette to, to convey a lot of information. Like all of these monsters are really recognizable of what they are. Um, however, uh, I had problems, <laughs> I was like very nervous because I had problems reaching out to this pixel artist. I think a very important thing uh, when you find some pixel art on the internet is to actually make sure that uh, the artists who made the pixel art are okay with you using their pixel art. Uh, so always reach out to the artist, always be like humble about it, ask them for permission, and if they don't re react or if they say no, then please accept that and don't use their pixel art. Um, yeah, don't don't be don't be a jerk to other people. Um, so I was like, I, I, Kirai S didn't actually answer my 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 contacts here. Some some tweets from me, I didn't answer my questions. So I was like, I'm getting a bit worried because I thought, oh, okay, I, I guess I will have to redo those monsters from my prototype. I will actually have to do my own pixel art. 
Um, but then just yesterday, Kirai actually answered and he was like, oh, I'm sorry, you're, you have my permission to use those characters. So I was really relieved and now we can actually use the same characters that we had in our prototype for, um, for, uh, the, for the game. That's great, right? So, so yeah, that's what, what we're going to do. We're going to actually add the, the animation of the first monster to our game now. And then we're going to see if we, um, if we can put this monster on the screen. And that's going to be the end of the episode, just making sure that the monster appears on the screen somewhere. Um, one more thing before we begin. Uh, something that I said, like, um, this uh, system is actually something that some of you could use without the um, procedural generation to make your own RPG, just using like this map system here and just like drawing your beautiful RPG world and doing whatever you want. If you do that, however, look at this. What are these? That's weird, right? Why are these like these st stone blocks here? We didn't put them down here, right? Well, the problem is you have to be remember that half of the tile map, so two and three, these two, two and three, share the same memory space as the half of the, the lower half of the map. So if you want to actually use the full tile map, then you can't use this full map. You actually, at some point when you zoom out, you have to stop drawing. Like here at, this, at the middle point here, you have to start drawing because the, this lower half is um, used by the tile map. And you will see like stuff popping up when you use the full tile map. So for example, if I also like come in here and start drawing some tiles here, right? Did I actually see it? Did I draw them? I didn't draw them, yeah, let's see. I draw them here, right? Um, you will see that pixels show up here. That's because again, ma the map and the tile, like the map and the tile map, are sharing um, the same space. Uh, so in our case, we don't need it. We don't need that extra map space because we're just going to use like this one one corner basically of the map to, and we're going to draw all our procedurally generated dungeons in there. But if you wanted to make your own dungeons and your own like own big world that you draw yourself without procedural generation, then you might want to like um, order your um, your tile map differently. You might, might want to move your characters a bit up so they're not like actually maybe in, uh, interacting or the chance of them interacting with your map are lower. Okay, so uh, I, I guess at this point uh, you probably already see me uh, drawing the first character that we're going to use here. So the first character that we're going to try to create is kind of going to be like this little slimy monster. And we're done, that's it. So this is a very small, uh, simple monster, just a little slime that bobs up and down. I really love the animation that Kirai the S is doing here. That's, that's really some masterful stuff. Uh, something I really like, I'm really learning a lot by just analyzing the kind of like um, pixel art that he does, or she does, or that they, they, <laughs> that they do. Um, something I really love is how um, they, they always create like this, um, this four frame animation um, but quite often like two of the frames are identical so you kind of have like basically like a neutral stance and like two extremes going uh, uh, down uh, going like in two extremes up and down in the our case so we have like the slime just sitting there and one um, one stretched up and one um, stretched flat and of course you know this is like animation principles you know there's like squash and stretch making sure that kind of like the the volume of the monster stays the same so it's not just making the monster wider but also making it it um less um less tall so it kind of like the volume of the monster is visually perceptive is, is the same so this little slimy guy here we actually want to um, ma make this guy now appear in our game somehow so we have to think about this how are we going to do this so let us let us start let us start trying some stuff. So I will create a new array called mob. And then I will create a new tab and this is going to be um, mobs and items. Let's just go for mobs first and then later on we're going to add items. And I'm going to call a function called add mob. Something like add mob. So it just creates a mob. And that's gonna be a mob. Let's go type or tube. Um, mob x, mob y. Something like this is what I'm thinking. That's my, my, my idea here. 
And so, you know, eventually, uh, I think this mob could turn into a lot, like, start, could start, like, having, we're going to start adding more information about what a mob is and what, what it stores. But I think, like, some very important things is it's supposed to have, like, a position. I think that's a, that's a very important, very simple thing. Um, what else? Well, we're not going to think about HP and stuff like that. That's um, that's actually something that, that may be important later on. But uh, we definitely want to have an animation. Now, we're going to figure out later on how, we do, how the animation exactly works. First, I just want to see a mob on the, uh, like the slime on my screen, right? Um, so this is going to be 192, 193, 194, 195. And again, uh, this is just like preliminary to have something on a screen to see something. Um, so that's gonna be that's gonna be just uh, enough. So then I will just go here mob, and then I'm gonna add mob of the type zero. It doesn't care actually where, and then I'm gonna figure out where to put the mob on the map. Uh, so now we have to like put um, just create like a spawning location for the mob to kind of, so we can actually see him. Let's just spawn him like directly next to us here. Uh, zero two zero three. So like two. Three. Okay, we, we are re-adding this mob. Um, we're not adding this mob. We just created this mob. Let's add him to the mob list. So add mob M. Um, at this point, we might be thinking that maybe it might be worthwhile not creating this local function, but we might, just like we have like this uh, add wind function here, we might be doing more with a mob here. So I'm just going to leave it out just, just like, like here for now. Again, I'm kind of like in a bit new territory. I'm trying to like... I did a similar system before, but it wasn't had like some different requirements. Okay, so now we added this mob. Uh, all that's left to do, we actually want to draw the mobs. So let's go something like um, for all for m for m in all mob and and then we're gonna go um, we're gonna just draw the sprite here, right? So we're just gonna like basically do the same thing as we do with a sprite drawing here, except. Here we're gonna go m.ani, and when we do, go p.x, we're gonna go m.x, and um, so we already see, ah, okay, so um, there is an offset x here happening with our player. We might be actually add the same things to our map later on. Uh, for now, let's leave it out and go like m.y. Um, 10 is the color of the mob, that's good. Ah, and we also see flipped, we're gonna also call this false. Cool, 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 cool. Okay, that should be it, let's try this. Um, ah, there's a do I we forgot. Mm, a player is a nil value. Oh yeah, <laughs> we, those experiments here are... And it works, we have our, our monster here. Of course, we cannot interact with a monster. That's kind of like something that we can have to think about uh, next. But we already have like a little monster here spawning here. And so the next step um, in our journey is gonna be making sure that this monster, um, like expanding the system. So we want to be able to interact with those monsters. But I think first, I think first it might be worthwhile uh, actually making sure that our own character belongs to this mob system because already when we when we did this there was already something that was odd look how you know we're drawing the sprite with the mobs but we just basically copied the same thing from our um, from our player drawing so if player becomes part of these mobs then we can just draw all of the mobs and then that all of the characters are being taken care of so this is going to be kind of like a next big step turning our player character into a mob expanding our mob system to be able to um, take care of our player. Thank you for um, for joining me this time around. I, I'm sorry for this being, being like this more, you know, talkative episode, but I think sometimes it's very important to establish like some some theoretical stuff. Um, again, as always, the text, the code for this for this episode is going to be down in a doobly doo. Um, keep posting those beautiful comments. Keep pointing out all the uh, horrible mistakes that I did. I will definitely read them all of them and try to um, fix the mistakes that you found. Um, and yeah, and of course join the Discord as always to play the prototype and maybe you can find some of those mistakes there as well. 
uh, or give me like some gameplay tips because uh, some people are playing the prototype and there's like a lot of discussion that maybe the prototype is too hard or maybe there's some kind of like tweaking some some balancing uh, that we can do here so i'm eager to figure out what you guys think see you next time around guys bye bye